Today we're talking about question answering, but rather than talking about the latest and greatest approaches, we'll be talking about the good old days of computers answering questions in the mid 20th century. The history of question answering begins with answering questions about the American sport of baseball. Since one of my big interests is in comparing human versus computer ability, let's see what the state of the art of human question answering about baseball was in the middle of the 20th century. I'm telling you, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. You know the fellow's well, name? Yes. Well then who's playing first? Yes. I mean the fellow's name on first base. Who? The fellow playing first base for St. Louis. Who? The guy on first base. Who is on first? Well, what are you asking me for? Let's take a look at the baseball system from MIT. Despite the odd phrasing, the baseball system of Green et al. is essentially a natural language interface to some existing database. This database interface is created by looking at each word in the question, trying to match it to a field in the database. The challenge then is to find out what the question is looking for, which is usually found in the question word. This is quite a bit simpler than the lexical answer type analysis of the Watson system that we'll talk about later, where you need to figure out things like this Argentinian author could be Borges, Cortazar, or Puig. If you see something like we're, you know that this is probably asking about a place. But if you're familiar with database languages like SQL, you recognize that this is essentially a bunch of selects and weirs. This isn't even taxing the full breadth of SQL. To get to the next step, we need to turn to a system called Lunar, which, as you might guess, was answering questions about the moon. The lunar system could answer much more complicated questions, such as those that requires averages or averages filtered by some criterion. It can do this by converting the rich questions that it got into a recursive grammar. But before it could do that, it needs to analyze the grammatical structure of the input question. For example, the question, what is the average modal plagioclase concentration for lunar samples that contain rubidium, is analyzed with the following parts of speech. Notice that it's important to detect things like relative clauses, which restrict the level of analysis. After that syntactic analysis, it then gets turned into a logical form that can be executed against its database. It's probably not worth going into this. Our databases don't look like this anymore. One thing I found interesting in rereading this with the perspective of the 21st century is that Lunar also has something that looks like an IR component, although it's explicitly looking for documents tagged with a particular topic, unlike doing something like TF-IDF retrieval, which should bring to mind the Cranfield paradigm that we talked about before. The last old school QA system I wanted to talk about is probably the most famous of all, Sherdlu. Sherdlu was described in the thesis of Terry Winograd. Remember that name, we'll be seeing it again. Unlike the lunar and baseball systems, which are exactly what they say on the tin, I need to explain the name Sherdlu a little bit more. Since you're watching this on YouTube in 2022, you probably don't know what a linotype system is. It was the missing link between movable type presses, where you had to move the letters by hand, and just sending output from a computer keyboard to a real printer. The most amazing part of the system is that it had a keyboard. When you hit a key, it would jam some metal together to create a beautiful printing piece called a slug, one letter at a time. But one key the machine didn't have was a backspace. You couldn't undo melting metal together. So if you screwed something up, you needed some way to signal, hey, don't use this, this is a mistake. So the operator would basically button mash. Whoop, whoop. And the first two columns of the keyboard spell out etaun shurdlu, a phrase that represents when technology goes wrong, a warning that human intervention is needed to prevent garbage in, garbage out. You wouldn't want your readers to see this, after all, in a printed book. Thus, Etoen Sherdlu became the title of a short story by the author Frederick Brown. That story is about a linotype machine, the pinnacle of technology at the time. And this linotype machine became self-aware because it understood all of the information being fed into it. This machine became voracious, demanding more and more input until the protagonist of the story selectively feeds it Buddhist philosophy 
it achieves nirvana and stops torturing the poor populace. Despite its funny name, Schurdlu remains the OG question answering system. The basic idea is instead of just answering questions about a static world, you can move objects around in this 3D world. This is a later rendering of it. Back in the early 70s, computer graphics aren't as advanced as they are today. Well, how far we've come. And if the system couldn't tell what object you're asking about, the query or statement was ambiguous, it asked a follow-up question to clarify which one you meant. I'm not going to go through all of the components of Schurdlu, but it's fairly similar to Lunar. You parse the sentence into a logical form. The big difference is that the knowledge base isn't static anymore. It changes as the user interacts with the block world and moves stuff around. So this is the part of the diagram that's unique to Schurdlu. But I'm not going to talk about the details of the implementation that much. Why not? Because you've probably noticed that these systems are talking about narrower and narrower domains. They can just answer questions about baseball games, not even baseball players. Rocks from the moon, not rocks generally, that's too much. And even Schurdlu goes further to build its own tiny world and only answering questions about that. And that goes back to the origins of the name Schurdlu, taking text and making it into a reality rather than understanding the world as it is. And the world as it is has ambiguity. Let's go back to the who's on first bit that I started this video with. So let me explain the Abbott and Costello routine. There is a baseball player that has the name who. Costello cannot figure out that who is not an interrogative pronoun and never interprets it as a proper noun. Now normally that is the right way to do it, but natural language is funny and sometimes ambiguous. There could be someone whose name is who. Now what's the guy's name on third base? What's on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. He's on third. There I go, back on third again. And that's the big difference between modern QA systems and these older systems. They're small and brittle. When they work, they work really well. It's impressive what they can do, but they're not going to be able to handle random questions from people on the internet. But that's not to say that logic, semantic parsing, and knowledge bases have no place in 21st century question answering. Rather than taking a string of text and giving a single answer, there are probabilistic interpretations that provide a distribution over those interpretations. And then you can train approaches using the Cranfield paradigm to make sure that, yes, on average, it can answer the typical user's questions. We'll talk about how that transition happened in the next video leading up to the heavyweight contender in the question answering space, Watson. This is just a single lecture from a course. YouTube likes to show you these videos out of order, but if you go to the course webpage linked below, you can see the lectures in the right order and you can get resources like homeworks or suggested reading. You can also visit quanta.org if you want to learn about our systems for creating computers that can answer questions, where quanta stands for question answering is not a trivial activity. If you want to help the channel, provide a big gradient to the algorithm by liking and subscribing.